Welcome to the REI Diamond Interview, your source for real estate investment jewels of wisdom with Dan Breslin. Welcome to the REI Diamond Interview, your source for real estate investment jewels of wisdom. I am Dan Breslin, and on these REI Diamond Interviews, I bring you the real estate investment community's brightest minds. Today, I'm here with a special guest, Jason Boozy, who I'm going to welcome on in just a second. But first, I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping. I'd like to let everybody know the topic of this podcast is going to focus on we're going to get into some new construction. We're going to get into wholetailing real estate, and we're probably going to dive into some of the specifics of one of the hottest real estate markets in the United States right now, San Francisco. But I do want to warn everybody that these are high content podcasts. We're not trying to sell anything. We're just doing this to, you know, give generously of our knowledge. So I'd really like to first start off by thanking Jason for giving of his valuable time. Welcome to the show, Jason. Jason Boozy. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. So I guess, you know, for those that are listening, let's kind of dive into your origination story. How did you get started in real estate? And also touch on what you did before you got into the real estate business, Jason. Well, I was in the mortgage business before I got into real estate, which seems like it's related, but it's actually very different in terms of what I was doing then and what I'm doing today And once I got into real estate. When the mortgage business was really good, it was really, really good, and I was making ten, twenty thousand a month which back then seemed like a lot of money. Uh, Not as much today anymore compared to what I'm making these days, but back then that was great money. But the problem was that every time interest rates went up, business dried up. And when interest rates went down, you'd make a lot of money. So in like 2004, it kind of dried up again. And by the end of 2004, early 2005, I was really thinking, you know, I need to find something else to do. I've always been an entrepreneur. I have the education, but I never wanted to get a corporate job to go with my degrees and just wasn't a fit for that. You know, I'm sure a lot of your listeners can relate where you don't really want to work for somebody else and you don't like having a boss and you like having the flexibility and being your own boss and making your own schedule and not taking orders from somebody who's probably less intelligent than you. So I really kind of wanted to have my own business for many years, and I wasn't sure how to go about that or what that would be. And, you know, a few things that I tried here and there didn't do really well. And then in 2005, a friend of mine had just gotten his real estate license and was becoming an agent, but was also starting to flip. I think he had just bought his first house to rehab, and he was in the middle of that project. And that coincided with me just being really down and out and being down to like a couple thousand dollars in the bank and wanting to somehow get involved. So I said to my friend, how do I get involved in this? Because I see you're doing real estate. Sounds interesting. I don't have any money. I don't have any knowledge on how to fix up houses. My credit's probably not even that great at this point. I don't have a job. But what I do have is the desire and will and determination to make something happen. Is there something I can do to help? And he said, yes, uh, find us a house off market. I said, okay, where do you want it to be? And he gave me a couple areas that would be good. He didn't tell me how to do it. And I kind of came up back then with a system that I still use to this day. So the first thing I did, I didn't go to any seminar. I didn't get any books. I didn't buy any courses. I didn't even watch the infomercials. And I know a lot of people got started in those ways, and that's good. But I kind of came up with my own system which like I said, I'm still using to this day. So what I did was I started talking to real estate agents and nobody told me to do this. It was just kind of like my common sense and intuition that I should start talking to people who deal with houses if I'm going to be looking for houses. And I asked them, do you know of any houses that are not yet on the market? And within a couple of weeks, I met a number of them. I got business cards. I gave them my number. I don't think I even had cards made at that point, but I gave them my information, got theirs. And two or three weeks later, one of them called me and said, actually, I know of a house uh, that's coming up that's not on the market yet. You said you're an investor, and it might be a good deal for you to flip. So I went and checked it out. Now, I have to tell your listeners, because I know you're in different markets, that I live in probably the most expensive real estate market in the country. The average home price here is now over $1 million. So when people hear these numbers, you know, I know it sounds a little bit shocking if you're in other parts of the country, 
but that's just the kind of numbers here. But what comes along with that is a very sort of competitive market, sellers that are more sophisticated, buyers that have a lot more money, international investors. A lot of money is you know, thrown around. So, for instance, right now I'm looking at a 20 unit in Kansas City for 45000 that somebody brought to my attention recently. I don't know if I'll do it or not. I'm, I'm still checking out the deals very early on. But, you know, to me, those numbers are like a joke. That's like a used car here. And homes here tend to be pretty much in the million-dollar price range. So that very first home that I found in 2005, they wanted a million for it. Actually, that home today is probably worth over $2 million. But back then, that was a million. And I think a lot of people would have been intimidated by that. But I thought, okay, let me see if I can work this out. Now, I didn't even know the term wholesaling at the time. But I, and I, again, I had not taken any courses. I had not gone to any seminars. I had not listened to any podcasts. I think they hardly even had any back then 10 years ago. So I didn't really know what I was doing. But somewhere down the road, and I think it was overhearing a real estate agent when I was doing a mortgage transaction, I just overheard something about he was assigning contracts. This real estate agent was assigning contracts and putting and or assignee on them and finding buyers. So I just remembered hearing about that. And, you know, I never sat down with this person and never really figured out how it worked. But I kind of just had this little bit of a sense. And I said, well, can you put and or assignee on the contract and let's offer 950 on it? Now, I had $2,000 in the bank. I didn't have the money to buy this house. I didn't have the money even for the down payment. But I, I made that offer knowing about assign, assignment of contract a little bit and just having some vague notion that, that you know if I did that and then found a buyer that I could somehow get paid. So what happened was I offered 950 They came back at 975 and they signed the contract. And now I have a contract in my name saying and or assignee, but they want a deposit check within three days for 3%, which is almost $30,000. Here I am with $2,000 to my name. So I told them, like, can you wait? Can you give me a few days to come up with the money? Because I technically have three days. And they said, okay. And now I knew that I basically have three days in which to find a buyer who will take over that property. I went back to my friend, told him about the deal. He was kind of on the fence about it. It wasn't really just him alone. It was some investors that he had. So I'm starting to panic. I'm thinking, I've got to make this happen. I can't just count on my friend. I put an ad on Craigslist. I contact people. I have some other people look at it. Everybody's on the fence. And then day three comes around, the last day, and his because they're going to cancel it if the deposit doesn't go in and we don't perform. His investors finally decided, okay, they will do it. They put in the deposit. They give me a check up front for $25,000. Nice. A week earlier, I was broke with $2,000 in the bank, and now I have $25,000, which at that point was the biggest check I'd ever seen. And I'm like, I'm on cloud nine, as you can imagine. I'm in heaven. Can you imagine, you know, I was broke. The whole past year was very, very difficult. I hardly made any money. The year before was great, where I was doing really well in the mortgage business, but all that money and all those savings are gone. I don't know what I'm going to do for a living. And here I am discovering this exciting new business, and I just walked away with $25,000 just for finding an off-market deal and putting together the buyer and the seller. So that was that was my start. That was how I did my very first deal. That's beautiful. So I'm going to – I had a similar experience, and I tap dance out at a closing with my $6,000 assignment check on a $5,500 contract that I found from a $100 classified ad, used my last 100 bucks to take an ad out for a week and basically put the together a deal. And mine was not in the nicest. It was in the least desirable, cheapest area. As you can imagine, if I have a $5,000, $5,500 contract, but let's pick apart here. I'm going to point out a few of the similarities. If there's anybody on the call who's not already doing this and, and kind of doesn't understand, this is monumental that you controlled a million dollar property without having to put the earnest money down. So, I have people that I'm doing deals with in various markets throughout the country right now, and we've had a deal that I'm thinking of fall apart somewhere in the half million dollar range because they wanted, uh, you know, five grand earnest money or whatever it was. We we couldn't. My guy was newer, and he didn't have the language set or the idea to basically 
lock up this contract for the three day period. It was like you didn't need 30 day period like we would like on a contract. And maybe out of just ignorance and not knowing, you know, the norms of the business, you were able to get that three day period to go shop the deal. So if anyone's listening, sometimes you can control a deal and float it around to a few of your VIP buyers, just like, you know, one of your guys who was a, a you know, a partner, whoever helped put the deal together. And, you know, only a three day control window of that deal was enough to produce $25,000 assignment. And, and one of the things too is you mentioned finding the house off market. And that's kind of my specialty too, Jason. I put together probably about 20 deals a month in a few different markets around the country. Every one of those deals are off market. They're not listed with real estate agents. They're not on the MLS. They haven't been picked over. That's kind of the value that I bring to the table. Is that kind of the same thing that you still do bringing to the table is is finding the deal, right? Absolutely. I personally, exclusively, ever since I started 10 years ago, and it's going to be actually my 10-year anniversary is right around now, only do off-market, have always only done off-market, focus exclusively off-market. And that's important, especially in an area like mine that is so competitive, because everything that's going on MLS right now, on the multiple listing system, it's getting multiple offers, it's selling way above, unless the sellers are really greedy and just overpricing it. And then people say, well, why don't you go after the greedy ones and lowball them? Well, those people are greedy. What's the chance they're going to take a lowball offer when if they just even know that they lowered it a little bit, you know, they'd get their number. Those people are not motivated. Now, I don't buy into the motivated sellers hype. I think that's a little bit overhyped. I don't think my seller has to be motivated. I like to actually use a different term. I like to say reasonable sellers. If I have a reasonable seller, I can work with them. And I just think the whole motivated seller stuff that you hear from so many gurus, I just feel like that's a little bit overhyped out there in the industry. You know what I mean? I agree with you. And one of the other terminology things I've swapped out is rather than it's a low ball offer, we make realistic offers. We make realistic yeah. cash offers based on what myself, I flip houses. I don't do new construction yet. And we do some wholesale deals and we make realistic offers based on the risk involved with closing on that deal with cash, doing a renovation with cash. And then, you know, we're risking the same thing. If we're in a if we're in a market where the interest rates tick up, that's going to affect our values in a certain way. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, there's multiple beautiful. factors that you have to take into account. You're dealing with probably, on the most part, I'm guessing you're dealing with smaller numbers than me. If you're dealing with a $100,000 house, you know, if you want to make thirty grand, you know, you need a bigger discount. If I'm dealing with a million-dollar house, if I can even somehow make 5% of that, I'm, I just made fifty grand. you know. So, you know, yeah, a lot of these low-ball kind of gurus, they come from markets that are very low-priced. So it doesn't apply as well here in the Bay Area. And just to give you another example, people that are listening to this might think, why did you have to come up with thirty grand as the earnest money? Why couldn't you just say $500, you know, as the earnest money? And then, then even you, with only $2,000 in the bank at the time, could have come up with that. Well, the answer is that I would have been laughed out of town. If I if I put a $500 deposit, they would never have accepted that. They would not have thought that I'm a serious buyer. So, which I wasn't to be honest cuz I didn't I didn't have the million dollars, but you want to at least <laughs> present yourself. And I, you know, and that ties into another thing. You know, I didn't have the money to close, and I but I knew that I needed, you know, to walk the walk and talk the talk because I knew that if they got an inkling that I didn't know what I was doing, that it's my first transaction, that I'm not sure I can close, that the deal would have fallen apart. You know, the agent would have walked away, the buyer would have walked, I mean, the seller would have walked away, the other investors would have walked away. It just would have all fallen apart on me. And the way that I kind of held it together is even though I didn't know what I was doing, I knew that I had to fake it till I make it. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. Jason, I have a question for you about, let's talk about the reasonable seller and let's talk about the discount that you would do for, you know, an 800 or a million or a million point five ARV type of house. Let's walk through one of those deals and maybe the circumstances behind what made that seller reasonable. I don't know. They were moving out of town. They're going back to China. I mean, what's going on with the seller in that instance and what kind of offer do you need them to accept in order to be in like the deal zone? That's a good question. You know, a lot of my reasonable sellers, they're just moving. They're planning to move after 
many times, 30, 40, 50, in one case, 60 years that she was moving. And wow. they're either moving <laughs> in with their kids. You know, the case of the, the woman that I'm mentioning now, 60 years, she was actually moving in with her daughter. She's in her 90s, daughter's in her 70s, and she lived in that house for most of her life. And her daughter just doesn't want her to be alone anymore. Daughter is very well off, businesswoman. The mom is well off. The house was worth probably close to two million at the time. And they're not distressed. They don't need to sell. But you know, you kind of meet with them and you build a rapport and you you make an offer or you listen to what they want. And I'm trying to get better at listening to they, what they want because sometimes what they want is actually less than you were going to offer. So that's why they say wow. you should try to find out what they what they want before you make an offer. Hmm. Well, I had a seller that told me, you know, the house, you know, these houses are worth 1.5 million, and in my mind, I actually knew that they're worth more. So I would have probably offered higher. But if they're telling me, if you want to sell me your gold watch for 50 bucks, I'm not going to argue with you that I should give you 200 for it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's not the business I'm in. I I'm in the business of making money and I'm not out there to screw anybody, but I need to have an upside. I'm putting in my money, I'm taking risk, I'm getting a loan oftentimes for these larger transactions. But back to the reasonable sellers, these are people that in most cases they're ready to move and whether they're moving in with the kids or whether they're moving into an old age home or whether they're moving out of state or out of the country whatever downsizing, whether they're upsizing. And sometimes it's the kids who inter inherited the property. That is my typical demographic. Now, on top of that, I also do a little bit of short sales, a little bit of pre-foreclosures, but that's not my main niche. The pre-foreclosure niche has gotten really saturated, for instance. So the reason is whenever you have a lot of gurus teaching one specific method and you have all these rookies and newbies going for the low-hanging fruit, that arena, whatever it is, will tend to get saturated. In this case, pre-foreclosures. Now, am I saying there's no deals in pre-foreclosures and you shouldn't do pre-foreclosures? I'm not saying that. No, I know there are deals to be had. I just know that anyone who's in pre-foreclosure, especially in my area, is getting a ton of mail, is getting every investor going after them, every agent going after them, every hard money lender going after them, is getting people knocking on the doors, is getting people calling them, and is getting any kind of mail that you can imagine from the FedEx or the FedEx looking one to the postcard to the handwritten mm -hmm. to the yellow letter, you name it. I went to see a woman who was in pre-foreclosure several years ago. I've since then stopped marketing directly to them. And I said, you, you must be getting a lot of mail. And she picked up this big pile of mail. I mean, there were dozens of letters in there with both hands. And she says to me, that's just from this week. Oh, my gosh. So that is a, that is a, that would be a motivated seller by most gurus definition because she's in pre foreclosure she's motivated but I was lucky she even called me and we didn't make end up making a deal because she wanted too much but she'd be the motivated seller I'd rather deal with a reasonable seller who is not getting a hundred other letters and is just willing to sit down and talk to me and sell to me at a reasonable price and doesn't hmm. have everybody else marketing to them so. I don't like to go after niches that are oversaturated, but everything's competitive now, but I don't want to go where it's, you know, oversaturated. And I feel like at least in my area, I can't speak for all other parts of the country because I primarily invest here in my area. I'm looking at some, you know, apartment buildings in other states and things of that nature just for buy and hold. But as far as flipping houses and 98% of what I do, it's right here in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a very competitive market, a very hot market. That niche of pre-foreclosures is saturated, I can tell you that. And I think that's true elsewhere, too. I'm sure it is. Yeah, I personally don't do much marketing. I don't do any marketing to pre-foreclosure. When I first got in the business in 2006, I used to send the letters and religiously once a week would have you know the girl in the office. We were putting the letters together. I may have done one deal over the course of three or four years, so I imagine that the, the mail pile must have been exactly what you're talking about. I mean, it explains beautifully why I wasted so much money and time going after those deals that never really amounted to anything. Yeah. How about the negotiation? So you go meet with this woman, a reasonable seller. Are you making an offer on the spot? 
planning to leave with a contract? Are you, you know, going uh, a week or two worth of negotiation, bringing the kids into it? Give me an example of kind of how that plays out, Jason. Yeah. So, you know, you kind of feel it out based on the vibe that you're getting from the person and what they're like and what they're basically telling you they want. So, you know, some people, they're just no nonsense. Okay, how much will you offer me? And other people are more chatty, they're more friendly, they want to get to know you, they want you to get to know them, they want to build a certain comfort level. I remember once listening to a guru, and I don't mean to beat up on all the gurus, because some people <laughs> might even say, Jason, you're a guru because you've spoken, but when I say guru, is somebody that uh, makes a substantial part of their living not just doing real estate, but teaching real estate. And I actually think that a lot of them have very good advice to impart, so I'm not trying to pick on them. But there are certain areas here and there where I have to disagree with with some of them. So there was this one, he said, when you go into a house, you know, to meet a seller, look at the pictures on the wall. You know, if they have trophies for football, start talking to them about football. If they have pictures of their kids, start talking to them about their kids. Well, if someone you just met within two minutes is starting to talk to you about your kids and your personal mementos in your house, I can tell you that depending the kind of person you are, you may not be that comfortable with it. Some people are going to be like, dude, I just met you and you're talking about my kids and you're talking about my personal stuff here in my house. That That's too much. Other people hmm. might warm right up to you. You have to try to read people. You know, everybody's different. So, the issue I had with what that guru was saying was he was giving a one-size-fits-all. And I know for a fact that some people are not just those kind of warm and fuzzy people that want to open up to you right away. Some people, it takes time. So I don't. I try to kind of adjust myself based on the person and based on the situation. If they say, like, they're no nonsense, how much will you pay, make me an offer, then I come ready to make them an offer. But other people, you can tell they want to have a certain comfort level with you before they'll even deal with you. It's like... A lot of cultures where people, you know, if they're having a negotiation, they sit for hours and hours and sometimes days and they drink and they smoke and they eat and they do everything but talk about the matter at hand because they're trying to build a comfort level first with their guest. Because to a lot of people, if I'm going to sell you my biggest asset, especially here in the Bay Area, my million dollar house, I want to feel like off-market, privately, not on the MLS. I want to feel like I kind of know you and you kind of know me and we, we're kind of friends somewhat. So a, a lot of situations are, I would say that's more the case that it takes several meetings until you actually nail it down the offer when I'm, when I'm dealing directly with the seller. But there have been cases where it happened on, on the very first meeting. You know, it's it just really depends on the seller. And I would say you have to adjust yourself to the person. If you're trying these one-size-fits-all strategies, regardless of who that person is in front of you, I would say that you're probably missing out on some deals that you should be getting. If every time I went and I made the offer right away, that would turn off the people that want to get to know me. If every time I went and I was like more social, on the other hand, that would turn off the people that are all business and they just want to know your number. So you have to kind of read people and adjust yourself accordingly. That makes sense. So give me an idea. Let's just, you know, briefly run through one example of the numbers of how that shakes out for this million dollar property. Maybe a recent rehab you bought rather than one of the wholesales and then we'll kind of switch gears and get into what wholesaling is and how you can actually make money doing that. First let's, you know, run through a standard rehab in this high end luxury San Francisco red hot market. Well, First of all, I also want to emphasize that I don't get all of my deals directly from sellers. They're all off market, but I also get quite a few from agents. In fact, this year, I think I got more from agents than directly from sellers. I think about five so far this year, I've done 15 deals. Five were from directly from sellers. One or two were referrals from wholesalers, and then about seven or eight were from real estate agents. When I'm dealing directly with a seller, I'll get, let me give you a number. So there's a property that I'm actually doing right now that is relatively cheap for this area. And I actually had sent them a letter and a number of other people sent them a letter, but they never called me directly. They gave my letter to their agent 
and the agent called me. And the agent said, you sent my client a letter last year. They held on to this for a year. Wow. And that happens a lot. You know, a lot of times you'll get a call and say, I got your letter a year or two ago. And my client is ready to sell now. And we're just calling. We don't want to put it on the market because it needs too much work. It doesn't show well. It may even not be safe for people to walk in because some of the stairs are broken and there's rats and there's all kinds of things. Hmm. And so we're going to sell it off market. We don't think it's in any condition to show on the market. And we don't want to do the fixing up ourselves. So we'll sell off market, but we want to get a few offers. So we're calling you. We're calling other investors that have sent letters. So I got a call. I went to see the house. As I was out there, there's another buyer out there, and he's wearing a home vesters shirt. Are you familiar with home vesters? We buy ugly houses. <laughs> oh, yeah. I knew I'm going to beat that guy because they're usually low ballers. Anyway, I made the offer through the agent, and I said, can you refer me to an agent? That, can you make the offer for me? And she said, no, I don't double end. She was very by the book. So at that point, I'm kind of playing it dumb, and I'm saying, well, do you have a another agent that you can refer me to that you know I could make the offer with? And I know hundreds of agents. Okay, why would I do that? Why would I ask her to refer me to somebody? Because the closer I am to the source, the better chance I have. If I have one of my agents, a buddy of mine, and I have plenty of friends that are agents, but if my buddy makes the offer and she doesn't know my friend, then am I more or less likely to get it than if I make the offer through her best friend and coworker who sits next to her in the office? I mean, the answer is obvious. So obviously, I'm going to try to do everything to increase my chances of getting my offer accepted. So I make the offer. She won't let. She won't double end it. So meaning she won't represent both the buyer and the seller. So she refers me to her best friend in the office. And I make the offer. Now, I think I was still the highest offer, but basically by a hair. So I decided to come in just a tad above 600. So I made the offer for 601. I got accepted. It was a seven-day all-cash close. I'm going on the market tomorrow as we speak, August 2015. I'm going on the market tomorrow, and we expect to sell over 800. I put 55,000 into it. So that was an example of a deal that I just recently got off market. It took me about a month to do the rehab, 55000 We painted it inside and out. We refinished the floors. We did new kitchen, new bath. We did a new roof, new central heating system. There wasn't any. Landscaping, all for fifty five k. Depending where you are, where you're listening to this, that might sound like a lot or it might sound like a bargain. I can tell you I got four bids, and that was by far the lowest one. And now I'm going on the market for 749 tomorrow and expecting to get multiple offers on that. We usually tend to underprice properties here when they go on the MLS in order to generate multiple offers. That's the strategy that works. But that's an example. I don't know if it's exactly the example you wanted. I can give you one where I negotiated with with the seller that might be better because here I didn't deal directly with the seller, but it's an example of the seller got my letter, they gave it to their agent a year later and I got the property and I rehabbed it. Do you want one of me negotiating with a seller? Well, let's stay on this for just a second. So you're expecting eight hundred grand. Are you doing like a flat fee listing, or is that like a five percent, four percent listing fee would come out? So five percent agent's going to have to come out. I mean, what do you expect your profit to be on this deal when it's all said and done? I don't know if you use private money, yeah. partnership. You know, no anything anything that I sell <clears throat> over seven hundred is my profit. So if I sell for eight hundred, which is what I expect to get, about eight hundred. It's actually being conservative because smaller properties recently sold for 800. Mine's bigger, so I'm hoping to get more. But I, you know, I always like to be conservative. So at 800, I net 100k. Yeah, that's interesting. I am a slightly boggled because I, I just don't have much experience closing these deals, and uh, we're working on a few right now in the Chicago market where I live. And this is an interesting perspective to see. I do know some other guys out in this market here, and they want you know. 70 cents on the dollar the way the home investors guys want but you know here you are looking at potential hundred thousand dollar profit on this eight hundred thousand it's a very interesting take but well yeah, because you can go through yeah go ahead. no i was going to say because you know when you're dealing with bigger numbers uh the arv and the, it, it needs to change a little bit and that's why a lot of people that have listened to these sort of nationwide gurus they stumble when it comes to higher-end markets like the Bay Area, <clears throat> maybe New York City, and maybe some of those because 
seventy percent. If I, my ARV is eight hundred, okay, I'm hoping to get eight hundred. If I would have offered seventy percent minus repair costs, which is the standard formula, seventy percent of eight hundred is five sixty. Repair costs is fifty five. Let's call it sixty. Now I would have offered five hundred. I would not have gotten the property. I offered six hundred, which is seventy five percent of ARV, and I got the property, and I'm still going to make a hundred k. Is that the formula you used on this? Was seventy five percent, or did you kind of like you know pick this no, number from I the air? No, what I I didn't use the formula. I don't I don't. I look at Have what's it going to cost me, and yeah, I look at what's it going to cost me, and what can I resell it for. And I also look at is it worth today? Before I did any work to it, is it worth today more than I'm paying today? So if I'm paying six hundred today, I can tell you that if I said I don't want to rehab it, I want to put it on the market, or I want to put it myself on Craigslist, I could have gotten more than that six hundred one that I paid. So I'm already starting ahead of the game, and. And then I looked at what's it going to cost me to fix? What's my cost going to be? How much can I resell it for? So I knew all along that I'm going for around 800 when I'm fixed up. And I kind of estimated that I'm going to put about 50 into it, ended up being maybe 5,000 more. And did my math on the commission and said, okay, that, you know, if I buy for 600 or 601 and I put 50,000 into it and I pay 5% commission, I'm basically at 700. I can sell it at 800 all day long. And that's a hundred thousand profit. That's how I look at it. These bigger numbers provide bigger profits, and they obviously come along with some bigger risk. What do you do right now to kind of hedge against something catastrophic happening like two thousand and nine? Uh, you know, since you're in these positions for big numbers. Well, you first you have to keep your pulse on the market and look at what's happening. I mean, things don't completely happen overnight. I mean, even what happened here in like. 2008, 2009 didn't totally happen overnight. There were some morning signs and there were some things along the way that, that transpired. For example, with the mortgage crisis started and then it obviously affected the housing market later. And some areas were affected earlier than others. Some of this was global and some of it's very local. Like, I mean, I know Southern California got hit hard 2005, six. We didn't really get hit till a couple of years later. As far as hedging, you know, one of your hedges is to not over leverage. Most of the properties that I own, I also own properties. Most of the ones that I'm going to buy and hold, I don't like to take out 80, 90% loans on them. I like to have 50% or more equity. I like to either own them free and clear or if I have a mortgage, a small mortgage. Like right now, I just bought something. It's worth 700 and he's carrying back. That's my first carry back. And I forgot to post about that in the group, but that reminds me that I'll do that after this call. It was my first ever carry back. I've never had a seller carry back before, believe it or not, because I never really asked. But he's carrying back a $240,000 mortgage at 6%. I'm paying, going to be paying him 1200 a month. The rest of it's equity. So I have a $700,000 house and I have a 240000 seller carry back. So I have almost half a million in equity there. And same with most of my properties. I have very small loans or no loan at all. And that's how you kind of hedge. You don't over leverage yourself. You pay attention to what's happening in the market. And you also buy properties at a discount. If you're buying a property at 20% below market, you already have somewhat of a hedge because even if the market goes down 20%, now you own it at what the market is, not at 20% higher than the market. It makes sense. Yeah, you're not going to get completely wiped out. Of, you know, eight hundred thousand dollar property is not suddenly going to be worth a hundred. I mean, that's not realistic. Yeah. So, yeah, it makes right. sense. So, you recently, I I followed a Facebook group, and we'll, you know, that was actually where I discovered your insights. I all of a sudden, you know, I, I'm on Facebook like everybody probably gets sucked into Facebook every now and again. I, I don't even know how I found the group. All of a sudden, I started seeing your posts, and I'm said, wow, he has some like pretty fantastic insights. And then I, I kind of like made an effort to make sure I get you on the show here. But I noticed you had mentioned some things about new construction and we had talked a few times before today. So let's talk about whether or not this was a conscious decision, how you made that, you know, some of the emotions that went along with kind of transitioning to new construction, if there were any along the way, and, you know, how you maybe put the team together to kind of start doing that. That's something I'm interested in. So maybe you could say, you know, give me a little advice on how I would go about doing my first new construction deal? Well, for the new construction part of my business, I really have to give a lot of credit to parents and other family members that got into it before I even did. So they kind of, you know, blazed the trail for me to follow. 
And so I can't take fully credit for that. But being in a high-end area like this one, we have luxury homes that sell for four, five million and up. You know, it goes up from there. There's a house now on the market that's over forty million, but I mean, I'm not touching that. But <laughs> um, <Wow. laughs> we've sold properties from new construction anywhere from two and a half to four and a half million. We're in that range. So what happens here in the Bay Area with these luxury homes? Almost everything is built up, but a lot of these homes that are in good areas now were built in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and they're single story and they're kind of becoming obsolete. They're older homes, but you have very valuable land. So what's happening is people are buying them, tearing down the old home and building a new one. Now, when you buy the old home, that land might cost you, let's say, 1.5 million. By the time you build a brand new home there that's three or 4,000 square feet, that brand new home, depending where it is exactly, could easily be three and a half, four million. So let's say that you bought it for 1.5, and let's say that you built a 3,000 square foot home. Your cost of construction is about 250 a square foot right now in my area. I know in a lot of parts of the country it's lower than that. In a lot of country, a lot of states, it's half of that. But here in the San Francisco Bay Area, because of the cost of labor and everything, it's about 250 a square foot if you talk to most builders. 3,000 hmm. square foot home at 250 a square foot. Do the math. That's 750k. You bought the land for 1.5 in a really luxury area, but it was an older home. So now you're invested 2.25. Now that 3,000 square foot home, depending where that is exactly, could sell for three and a half to four million. Let's take the lower figure and let's say three and a half. You're into it for 2.25. You sold the new home for three three and a half. You pay commissions and all that. You could net a million dollars. And we've done that, and many people I know have done that many times. So you can make a million dollars on a two or three million dollar investment by buying in the right area, knowing how to build, and building a new house. You have to stay attuned to what's happening in the market. You have to make sure you've selected the right area. You have to be on top of the contractors you're with, definitely. And this is one way to do it, and this is what we've done. Luxury single-family homes, one at a time. Now, other people make a lot of money in new construction doing entire subdivisions, doing you know, apartment buildings, doing commercial strips. There's multiple things that you can do in new construction, but my expertise has been single-family luxury homes in high-end areas. And as a result of us getting into it, several other people that I know have gotten into it in this area. Now, the, again, these numbers that I'm talking about, to most people, they're like, whoa, this guy is dealing with millions. And it's always scary when you first look at it, just like a lot of people would not have even done my first deal because it's almost a million dollars. And how are you doing that? You only have $2,000 in the bank. Well, a lot of people are intimidated by big numbers, and that keeps them away. So a lot of pe people are feeling in like the bottom shallow end of the pool where it's very competitive. It's actually more competitive at the bottom than at the top because everybody's lowballing, everybody's going for the pre-foreclosures, everybody's buying houses under 200 k and so on. When you get to the top, there's a lot of profit to be made. It takes a little bit more sophistication, but I can guarantee you there's tremendous opportunity at the top. But you need to know exactly what you're doing. Taking notes here. So when I say you need to know exactly what you're doing, you need to select the right areas, you need to select the right contractor, and you need to follow the market and stay on top of it. Like there are areas that I would build a luxury home and it could sell for three or four million. Okay. And if I go 10 miles south of that, I can't even get two million for that house. Same beautiful hmm. 3,000 square foot house, new construction. In one place, it'll sell for four million. Go 10 miles south, you won't even get two million. Go 20 miles east you won't even get 1.5 and it might sit on the market for months and months. You have to really look at the specific sub-market you're in. When I say sub-market, every metropolitan area, you said you're in Chicago, right? Chicago, Philly, Tampa. But you're physically in Chicago? Right now, yeah. So Chicago has like dozens of sub-markets, right? Like yes, sir. You got Evanston, you got downtown, you got Skokie. I mean, I don't really know all the areas. North side, south side, southwest yeah, exactly. suburbs. So here in the San Francisco Bay Area, same thing. We have dozens of submarkets. 
And if you go five miles or ten miles, you might go from like a great area to like a not so great area or even a bad area. Or you might go from a three million dollar homes area to a five hundred thousand dollar homes area. Doesn't get much cheaper than that anymore, but you know. I did buy a house this year for two hundred and twelve thousand though. That was the cheapest house I did this year. <laughs> That's great. How much was it worth when it was done? So that was a wholetail. Uh, maybe we, now we should talk a little bit about wholetailing, or do you want to stay on new construction? Perfect, yeah. I'll leave it up to you. Now I guess we're, uh, we, can, we can touch on the wholetailing now. Well, I love wholetailing. Wholetailing is a term that I don't know who made it up, but I've, used, I've heard it used by a number of people. I did not make it up. And it's basically a combination, as you can probably tell, of wholesale and retail. And the way that I use it and most people use it is you actually close on the property and sell it at retail value, but you're not rehabbing it. That's why I don't call it a rehab. And you're not wholesaling because you actually take ownership. You actually close on it in your name. So you take ownership, your own title. You could sell it an hour later. You could sell it a week later. But it's it's your house at some point. You're the owner. So I bought this house for 212 It was a probate deal. And I looked at it, and it needed a lot of work. And here, a house for 212 you know it's not in a great area. When you're in the Bay Area, you don't really have many houses for that kind of price range. So it was in a lower-end area, and there was a house actually for sale across the street for 350 that was completely remodeled, had another bedroom, and was nicer. So I looked at, if I completely rehab this house, and this 351 is still sitting there, what's the most I can hope to get? And the answer was about 320 because if this other house they're trying to get 350 and it's bigger, it's nicer, and it's not selling, mine is smaller, then even after rehabbing it, the most I can expect to get is 320 So I said, okay, if I can get 280 now and not have to do any work to it, that's as good as getting 320 after rehabbing it. Let me see if I can get somebody to pay me 280 for it as is right now. One of the first people I contacted was actually the agent who was trying to sell, listing agent for the house across the street that wasn't selling. Nice. And I said, I just bought the house across the street because who's going to know the market better and who's more likely to have buyers than somebody who's listing in that same neighborhood? I said, I just bought the house across the street from you and I'm looking to sell it. It's a fixer upper and I don't really want to do the work. I prefer not to. I don't want to list it. I was very clear with them. They're always going to try to get the listing right. I was very clear with him. I'm not looking to list it. If you can bring me a buyer at 280, I will sell it. I think initially I might have tried for 290. We ended up settling on 280. I had to pay him just one side commission, which was uh, 3%. And we got the 280. I bought it for 212. It was all cash deal. So we closed two weeks after I, either it was either two or maybe three weeks. From the time I bought the house for 212 until he brought the buyers that bought for me for 280, didn't do any work to it at all, and my net profit was 60,000 after commission. 60,000 is less than I make on a lot of deals, but 212 is less than I pay for most of my deals. It was almost a 30% return. So I made 60k on a house that I paid 212 for without doing any work to it in less than three weeks. That's a great ROI. Awesome. Yeah, plus the velocity of that money getting in and out of that deal. And how many days, Jason? From like closing three to weeks, closing? Within three weeks. Close to close. 21 close days. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, that's beautiful. So talk to me about the buyer on that property. Was it a mortgage buyer or a cash buyer, Jason? It was a cash buyer. It was an all-cash transaction. All-cash all transaction. Wholesale, I'm and sorry. that's a wholesale. All that's a wholesale deal because you're talking about I closed in my name. I, I didn't do any work to it, and I wholesaled it. Or I'm sorry. And I resold it, and that, that's the definition of a wholesale. You buy, you close, and you immediately resell without doing any work. Some people call now it a all, double close. Yeah. All the other wholesale deals that you have done, were they all cash buyers every time? Not always. You have... No, not at all. Not at all. Okay. Uh, in fact, they some are, and some they get a, they get a loan. It just takes you a little longer when they get a loan, but it's that's that's fine if they do. When I'm wholesaling as well as wholesaling. It's in, in both cases. Sometimes they're all cash. Sometimes they get a loan. If they're getting a loan, it just means instead of getting my money after a week, I need to wait a month. But that's fine. Okay. So how do you guys 
Is there seasoning requirements with any of the loans? I mean, a few years ago, you couldn't get away with this kind of stuff where you could sell a resell property in, you know, 30, 40, 50 days. You, you know, I, I've run into the same situation where I tried to wholesale property a few years back and I couldn't settle on the property until I had expired the 90 day seasoning requirement. Are you running into that or did you find a way to deal with that? You know, I haven't really run into it that much. Uh, and I've been doing this for, for years. Uh, the only thing that I did run into is that because when I was flipping within 90 days, the lender would be a little bit pickier. They didn't, I, I didn't see any lenders that, that don't allow it. So I'm a little bit surprised. Are you saying they didn't allow it or they were just pickier about it? Yeah. I mean, there was a period of time. This was like, you know, there were quite a few deals I did that, you know, the extent of my rehab was, was FHA? taking the curtains down and there was a possibility that it was FHA. So maybe that was, uh, okay. I FHA, I, FHA the... I think have a restriction, but I, I don't do any FHA. I've never done uh, sold to an FHA seller. There's very few FHA properties around here. Uh, but what I did notice with the 90 days is some of the lenders are pickier and, you know, like they'll make you get two appraisals and they'll just scrutinize a little bit more because you're within that 90 day period. But I didn't see any that don't allow it. But I think if it's FHA, that may be an issue. Hasn't really been an issue for me, I got to say, other than than them maybe requiring two appraisals. I may be going on erroneous information from the 2009-2010 era when it was more of an issue than it is today. That's cool. So what about the assignment fee? And you have people getting loans for wholesale deals, right? You just said that a minute ago? Yeah, because by the way, speaking of the 90 days, I mean, I'm almost always in and out within 90 days, with the exception, obviously, of new construction. That new construction process uh, is about a year. So, uh, which we didn't really get into because that that's probably an entire podcast that we could do in it in and of itself if we're going to talk about new construction. It's a whole big topic. But new construction, just to kind of wrap that up, is when we do it here, you're talking about six months to get your plans and permits approved. You get an architect, you get drawings, you submit them to the city, they send you feedback, you know, you make the plans, you make adjustments. Oh, the neighbor doesn't want this window like that because it's looking into their bedroom so you need to move it little things that you wouldn't really think of and then it's about another six months for the actual construction so that's about a year-long process with the exception of uh, the new construction when I do a deal and you also kind of ties into your early question about market risk I don't like these long rehabs I like to be in and out of them within within weeks maybe at most within like two months like my rehab here that I'm doing on the $600,000 house here, done in less than a month, back on the market. You know, one of the contractors that came out to give me a bid, she said it's going to be at least three months for this project to get done. Hmm. Interesting. Would you be willing to come on at a future date and we could really dive deep into the new construction uh, topic, I'd be, Jason? I'd be happy to do that, yeah. Cool. Man, we covered a lot of great topics here. I, got, I do have one other question that maybe you have a quick answer. So if you sell an wholesale deal to a buyer and the buyer is getting a loan, how does your wholesale fee appear on the sheet or are you collecting that in cash from the buyer separately? That is never the on the contract and it never goes through escrow. That's a side payment. Got so it. I have a three-page assignment agreement. The first two pages say I'm assigning this property to Joe Blow and he takes over the contract with all the rights and responsibilities. This is an addendum. This attaches to the contract. Then there's page three, which is the fee agreement. It says, Joe Blow is to pay Jason Boozy $50,000 for the assignment of 123 Main Street, San Jose, California. That part is just between me and my assignee. I get a check from him either up front or at the closing or upon removal contingencies. I try to get it up front. Worst nice. case, I try to get removal contingencies. That's, I should say, second worst case. Absolute worst case at close. When I can, I get it up front. And when I get that assignment fee, that is outside of escrow. That's not financed in the loan. Escrow doesn't know about it. Seller doesn't know about it and shouldn't know about it for obvious reasons. You tell the seller you have a partner. They don't need to know how you're compensated. You're not being dishonest, but you don't need to tell them how you're being compensated by your partner. They don't need to know if you're getting... 20% of the profit, or if you're getting 50000 up front. 
not yeah, in a sense them. you and you, of course they're gonna be annoyed. Yeah, of course. And in a sense you are the partner, Jason. You're just getting paid your profit up front and you're taking less yep. of the risk than the uh partner who's gonna take the lion's share of the profit on a wholesale. Absolutely. Deal. So I never refer to my buyers, my assignees, I never use the term wholesaling, my partners. And that's how you do it. Now, one issue though is that a lot of lenders won't finance when there is an assignment clause. They don't want to see that. So what we do is a lot of times you go back to your seller and you say, remember my partner, Daniel? Well, Daniel needs to get a loan on the property and the lender wants to see it in their name. So right now you have a contract with me. I'm going to have you do a new contract with Daniel. Nothing's going to change. The terms will be exactly the same. The price will be exactly the same. Everything's the same to you. But instead of my name is the buyer. It's going to be Daniel's name is the buyer. 99% of the time, your seller, who hopefully by that point you've built rapport and trust with, is not going to have an issue whose name is on the closing table because they're getting the same money with the same terms. So then we go and do a new contract, and now they can take that to their lender. I still have an assignment agreement with them. Hopefully, I've already gotten paid at that point. If not, I'm going to get paid at some point later. Most of the people that I wholesale to and I'm still doing a lot of wholesaling. Don't get me wrong. I'm doing rehabbing. I'm doing wholesaling, but I'm still doing a lot of wholesaling. Most of the people that I wholesale to, they're sort of repeat customers of mine that I've been working with for years, that we have a lot of trust in each other and good rapport and good communication. So I don't feel like I need to worry about them screwing me. They don't need to worry about me screwing them. And that's very important. People, I want to make this point to your listeners. Because a lot of people that get into this business get a lot of misinformation. And one of those bits of misinformation is you need to build a big buyer's list. My thing is build relationships, not a buyer's list. I'd rather have five people that I know and I trust and I know they're qualified. They're not BSers. They're not scammers. They're not going to try to re-wholesale my deal. They actually have the money. They actually intend to close. And I'd rather have five of those than a list of 100 people who I know nothing about that I got off Craigslist. I say build relationships, not a list. Nice. We're getting to the top of the hour here, and I know you have a busy schedule here, so I, I want to make sure we wrap it up. But uh, do you have any book recommendations, maybe from the beginning of your career, something you read lately, anything like that to share with our listeners, Jason? Yeah, one of the classics that I recommend, especially if people are relatively new to this business, is a book called Five Magic Paths. And I think the full name is Five Magic Paths to Real Estate Investing. But if you look up Five Magic Paths, and the author is Lumley, L-U-M-L-E-Y. And what's nice about the book is it covers wholesaling, it covers flipping, it covers commercial, it covers multifamily, covers a few different areas, well, five different areas of making money in real estate, the five main areas. So you can learn a lot. It's a great introduction guide, and I've learned a lot from it. Another book I'd recommend is by Robert Shemin, S-H-E-M-I-N. And specifically, I know he's got quite a few books out there, but I specifically liked his book that was put out by the Learning Annex years ago that covered different topics. And I'm sure some of his other books are good too, but I read that one and it was very good. And I also want to re- – those two books specifically on real estate give great tips and food for thought and some oversight. And there's also a lot of great podcasts out there. And another book that I want to recommend that's a great business book and psychology book, whatever business you're in, but it's not specifically only on real estate, is called Psychology, the Science of Persuasion. And I'm sorry, it's, I said it wrong. It's called, the book is called Influence, the Psychology of Persuasion or the Science of Persuasion by Cialdini. C-I-A-L-D-I-N-I. Look up Cialdini and the book is called Influence. And that is a great book because it covers people's motivations and what makes them tick and why some things sell and why some people act like they do. And it's not always that people act in logical ways. So those are three top books, two of them real estate and one is more like a general business book. And there's so many great books out there. And there's a lot of great podcasts out there. You can get a lot of information on real estate from podcasts. You You have your podcast and can I give a shout out to a couple other podcasts that I would recommend? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Tucker Merriu, M E R R I H E W. He has something called the Real Deals, D E A L Z podcast. 
Justin Williams has the House Flipping HQ podcast. They both have guests on and they talk about what's happening in their markets and how they're getting deals and some of the deals they're working on. And Bigger Podcast Pockets has great podcasts. There's a lot of really good podcasts out there that you can use for information. Nice. And I have one final question. Maybe you can answer for the new investor and then for the seasoned investor, and that is, do you have any final tools of wisdom that you'd like to share with our listeners? It's kind of hard to capture, you know, 10 years of real estate in one hour, which is what we try to do here. And, <laughs> you know, whenever you know, I do a podcast like this or an interview or sometimes I'm invited to speak, always after it's over, I realize there's so many things I didn't even get to talk about. Like one of them, for instance, is direct mail. And we talked about me getting deals from agents, but I also do a ton of direct mail and I do 5,000 plus letters a month. I would say you should be marketing directly to owners. And that's something we didn't really have the time to talk about. So maybe if we do a follow-up, we'll talk about that more, but you should test different marketing methods. Don't just do yellow letters. Don't just do postcards, test different ones, market directly to owners, test different lists, test different mail pieces, test different, you know, text within your letter or postcard and see what people respond to. Like I made a very simple change to my letter recently. I just kind of made it a little bit less formal actually and more casual. And I had some bullet points saying, this is what I can do for you. One, two, three, four, five. And then I spoke with somebody in San Diego who's very successful in that market. And he said, Jason, just make it like more like casual, like you're having a chat with them. So I still incorporated all the points in the letter. Like I can buy your house and you can stay there for a little while. You don't need to fix anything. I'll buy it as is. But instead of saying one, two, three, four, five, I actually wrote that in my letter. And actually my response rate increased after I did that. So I think it's important nice. to test different things in this business and to always kind of be growing and adapting and evolving. So that's kind of my main tip that I want to leave people with. Sweet. Do you, you do have a, I'll share the URL, but the Facebook group, a way for people to get more information about you, Jason, that you'd like to share? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I get a lot of calls. I get a lot of emails from different people. So, uh, you know, the best way to interact with me really is just come to the Facebook group. And if we start uh, chatting there or you have a deal or you want to ask me a question, I always, answer people's questions there. And if, if you have a deal, I'm sure that we can private message each other and get in contact. But I don't want to just give out my phone number and email because I just have so much going on already and I don't want to be just ignoring people. So the best way is really join the Facebook group. It's called Living the Dream. Maybe on the notes you can uh, give the URL for that because I think there's a couple of groups with similar name. But look for the Living the Dream uh, Facebook real estate group. And I'm also active in a couple other Facebook groups, but that one is specifically mine. I'm the mo moderator of the group. And I will include that. Like I said earlier in the interview, it's where I met Jason. Well, Jason, I do thank you for giving generously of your time and thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's been a lot of fun. And maybe we'll do that follow-up here and uh, I'll keep people posted. And thank you for listening to this episode of the REI Diamond Interview, your source for real estate investment tools of wisdom. You can sign up to receive an email update of weekly interviews at www.reidiamonds.com. As a bonus for signing up, if you're interested, I'll send you my free report on wholesaling titled Wholesale Houses 101. Nine Steps to Buy and Sell a House with No Money. That website, again, is www.reidiamonds.com. Until next time, this is Dan Breslin signing off. Thanks for listening to the REI Diamond Interview. To receive the REI Diamonds newsletter and interview monthly, sign up now at www.reidiamonds.com.